Over the years I have made up my own idea of France, born of both reason and feeling. In my imagination, France appears as a country that, like a fairy tale princess or Madonna on ancient frescoes, is destined for an extraordinary fate. Instinctively, I have the impression that Providence has destined France for great achievements or severe adversity. And if, nevertheless, her actions happen to bear the stamp of mediocrity, I see in this something unnatural, of which the deluded French are guilty, but not the genius of the whole nation. Reason also convinces me that France is only truly France if she stands at the forefront, that only great deeds can save France from the pernicious effects of the individualism inherent in her people, that our country in the face of other countries must strive for great goals and bow to no one, for otherwise she may be in mortal danger. In short, I think that France, deprived of greatness, ceases to be France. This conviction grew up with me in the environment in which I was born. My father, a man well-educated and brought up in certain traditions, was full of faith in the high mission of France. He first introduced me to her history. My mother had a feeling of unbounded love for her native land, which can only be equaled by her piety. My three brothers, my sister and myself, were all proud of our country. This pride, coupled with a sense of anxiety about its fate, was second nature to us. Nothing so impressed me, a native of Lillet, a child in Paris, as the symbols of our glory. The Cathedral of Our Lady of Paris, shrouded in the gloom of night, Versailles in its evening splendour, the Arc de Triomphe in the sunshine, the trophy banners swaying under the arches of the Palais des Invalides. Nothing made so strong an impression on me as our national successes. The popular enthusiasm at the visit of the Russian Tsar to France, the military parades at Longchamp, the wonders of the World's Fair, the first flights of our aviators. When I was a child, nothing caused me more distress than the manifestation of our weakness and our delusions. The abandonment of Fashoda, the Dreyfus affair, the social conflicts, the religious strife which were excitedly spoken of in my presence. Nothing made me more excited than the stories of our past misfortunes, when my father recalled the unsuccessful sorties at Borges and Sten, where he had been wounded, and my mother spoke of the despair she had felt as a child when she saw her parents weeping bitterly at the news of the surrender of Marshal Bazaine's army. In my youth I was particularly concerned with everything connected with the fate of France, whether it was the events of its history or contemporary political life. I was interested in and at the same time outraged by the drama constantly played out in the arena of political struggle. I marvelled at the intelligence, enthusiasm and eloquence of many of the participants in this drama. At the same time, I was dismayed that so much talent was wasted because of political chaos and internal strife, especially as the first harbingers of war began to appear at the beginning of the 20th century. I must say that in my early youth war did not inspire me with any horror, and I exulted what I had not yet experienced. I was convinced that France was destined to pass through the crucible of the greatest trials. I believed that the meaning of life was to accomplish a great exploit in the name of France, and that the day would come when I would have that opportunity. When I enlisted, the army occupied a very large place in the life of any European country. Subjected to attacks and insults, the army waited calmly and with secret hope that the days would come when everything would depend on it. After graduating from saint Cyr Military School, I enlisted in the 33rd Infantry Regiment at Arras, where my officer service began. My first regimental commander was Petain, who revealed to me the full value of the talent and art of a military commander. Subsequently, when, like a straw, I was seized by the hurricane of war and experienced all the vicissitudes of this drama, the baptism of arms, the hardships of trench life, attacks, shelling, wounds and captivity. I could see that France, deprived by a low birth rate and the carelessness of the authorities of a large part of the means necessary for her defence, still managed to make an incredible effort and to make up by her incalculable sacrifices what she lacked in order to emerge victorious from this ordeal. At the most critical periods of her history, I saw France morally united, first under the Aegis of Joffre and then under the leadership of Tigre. Afterwards I witnessed her, exhausted by loss and destruction, shaken to the core and thrown out of moral equilibrium, take again an uncertain step towards her destiny while her government, assuming its former appearance and rejecting Clemenceau, abandoned its policy of greatness and reverted to chaos. In the years that followed, my career passed through a series of different stages. A tour of duty in Poland and participation in the Polish campaign, 
teaching history at the St. Cyr Military School and then at the Military Academy, serving in Marshal Patain's office, commanding the 19th Jager Battalion at Treves, serving at headquarters on the Rhine and in the Levant. Everywhere I saw the restoration of France's national prestige as a result of its recent successes, but at the same time a sense of uncertainty about the future of France generated by the inconsistency of its leaders. Meanwhile, military service gave great satisfaction to my heart and mind. In the army, which was in a state of inactivity, I saw a force destined for great achievements in the near future. It was clear that the end of the war had not secured peace. As Germany recovered her strength, she returned to her former pretensions. While Russia was fully occupied with her domestic situation, America kept aloof from European affairs, England connived with Berlin that Paris needed her help, and the newly created states of Europe were still weak and fragmented, France alone had to restrain Germany. She did endeavour to do so, but she acted inconsistently. At first, our government under the leadership of Poincare applied to Germany a policy of coercion, then, on the initiative of Briand, made attempts to reconcile with her and, finally, began to seek salvation in the League of Nations. However, the German threat was becoming more and more real. Hitler was marching steadily toward power. During this period, I was appointed Secretary of the Supreme Council of National Defence, a permanent body under the Prime Minister in charge of preparing for war the state apparatus and the entire nation. From 1932 to 1937, under 14 different ruling cabinets, I took part in the work of studying all kinds of political, technical, and administrative measures connected with the defence of the country. In particular, I familiarised myself with the security and arms limitation plans proposed at Geneva by André Tardieu and Paul Boncourt, respectively. I prepared the materials necessary for the Dummergarten government to decide on a change of foreign policy in view of Hitler's rise to power in Germany. I had to redraft the draft law on the organisation of the state in time of war an endless number of times. I was engaged in the development of measures to mobilise civilian administrative bodies, various branches of industry, public services. The fulfilment of these duties, participation in meetings, communication with various political figures, allowed me to be convinced of the enormous possibilities of our country, but at the same time, in the weakness and inefficiency of its state apparatus. This area was characterised by a lack of any kind of stability. I do not mean to say that the people who worked here lacked skill or patriotism. On the contrary, I saw undoubtedly worthy and sometimes exceptionally talented people at the head of ministerial offices, but the peculiarities of the political regime itself constrained their capabilities and led to a waste of energy. A silent but by no means indifferent witness to all the vicissitudes of French political life, I watched the same game constantly repeating itself. As soon as the head of the government took office, he was immediately confronted with innumerable demands, attacks and claims of all kinds. All his energies were fruitlessly expended to put an end to them. Not only did he meet with no support from Parliament, but on the contrary, the latter plotted various intrigues against him and acted in concert with his opponents. Among his own ministers he found rivals. Public opinion, the press, and certain groups expressing private interests considered him the culprit of all the troubles. At the same time, everyone knew, and he knew first and foremost, that his days as head of government were numbered. After a few months in power, he would be forced to give way to another. In the field of national defence, such conditions prevented the formulation of a coherent plan, the adoption of deliberate decisions, and the implementation of necessary measures that together constitute what is called coherent policy. This is why the top military cadres, deprived of systematic and planned guidance from the government, were at the mercy of routine. The army was dominated by concepts that had been adhered to even before the end of the First World War. This was greatly facilitated by the fact that the military leaders were senile in their posts, remaining adherents of outdated views that had brought them glory in their time. The idea of positional warfare was the basis of strategy, which was going to be guided in the future war. It also determined the organisation of troops, their training, armament and the entire military doctrine as a whole. It was assumed that in the event of war France would mobilise its reserves and form from them the maximum number of divisions, designed not for manoeuvring, offensive and development of success, but in order to hold the defensive areas. These divisions were expected to take up positions along the Franco-Belgian border, with the assumption that Belgium would be our, our ally 
and in these positions would wait for the enemy's offensive. As for such tanks, planes, and mechanically powered guns with circular firing, which in the last battles of the World War had shown their suitability for making surprise strikes and breaking through the front, and whose power had been continuously increasing ever since, they were to be used only to strengthen the defense or, if necessary, to restore the front line by means of local counterattacks. In this regard, the appropriate types of weapons were determined. Slow-moving tanks, armed with light small-caliber guns and designed to accompany the infantry, but not for rapid and, most importantly, independent action and fighter planes to protect the airspace. At the same time, the bomber aviation was weak, and attack aircraft were completely absent. Artillery guns with a narrow horizontal sector of fire, adapted for firing from a particular position, were ill-suited for moving over any terrain and for circuit. In addition, it was assumed in advance that the front would run along the Maginot Line, the continuation of which would be the Belgian fortifications. Thus it was thought that an armed nation, sheltered behind this barrier, would hold the enemy and wait until, exhausted by the blockade, he would collapse under the onslaught of the free world. Such a military doctrine was in keeping with the very spirit of the ruling regime. Doomed to stagnation by the weakness of state power and constant political dissension, it was inevitable that it should adhere to this passive military doctrine. It played the role of a reassuring panacea and was so consistent with the mindset of the country that any politician who sought election, applause, or an opportunity to speak in the press had to publicly acknowledge its high qualities. Being under the illusion that by declaring war it was possible to prevent the aggressors from unleashing war, remembering the attacks for which they had had to pay such a heavy price, and not clearly realizing the technical revolution, which had taken place in military affairs in the meantime, public opinion did not even think of offensive action. In short, everything contributed to putting the principle of passivity at the heart of our national defense. To me personally, such a direction seemed extremely dangerous. I believe that in strategic terms, it entirely and completely gives the initiative into the hands of the enemy. From the political point of view, I believed that the broadcast statements of our intention not to withdraw our armies outside the Fenitz encouraged Germany to act against weak and isolated countries and areas. The Saarland, the Rhine states, Austria, Czechoslovakia, the Baltic states, Poland, etc. It seemed to me that in this way Germany was encouraged to act against weak and isolated countries and areas. It seemed to me that in this way we were alienating Russia from its alliance with us and also making Italy realize that under any circumstances we were not going to stop its malicious actions. Finally, from the moral point of view, it seemed to me pernicious to persuade the country that in the event of war France's participation would be reduced to fighting as little as possible. It must be said that the philosophy of action, the questions of the training of the armed forces and their use by the state, the problem of the relationship between the government and the military command have long interested me, and I had the opportunity to express my thoughts on this subject in such works as Discord in the Enemy's Camp, at the tip of the sword, as well as in a number of journal articles. In particular, I gave several public lectures at the Sorbonne on the conduct of war. But in January 1933, Hitler became the full master of Germany. From that moment on, events were bound to unfold at a rapid pace. Since there was no one to suggest anything appropriate to the situation, I felt it my duty to appeal to public opinion and outline my own plan. But as this might have some consequences, it was to be expected that the day would come when I would be the subject of public scrutiny. It was not without hesitation that I decided to speak out after 25 years of obedience to official military doctrine. In a book entitled For a Professional Army, I outlined my plan and my ideas. I proposed to proceed immediately to the creation of a shock maneuver army which would include selected mechanized and armored troops and which would exist along with the formations staffed on the basis of mobilization. In 1933 I raised this question in the journal Politics and Parliament, and in the spring of 1934 my book was published, which gave arguments in favor of creating an army adapted to our conditions and justified the principles of its organization. Why do we need such an army? Focusing first of all on the defense of France, I pointed out that the geographical conditions predetermining the possibility of invasion of our territory from the north and northeast, the national peculiarities of the German people with its inherent exorbitant claims, drawing them west through Belgium to Paris, and finally the character of the French people 
by virtue of which it is caught unawares at the beginning of every war. All this, I stressed, forces us to keep part of our forces constantly ready, so that at any moment you can... We cannot, I wrote, count on the fact that poorly manned and poorly equipped troops occupying hastily created defensive lines will be able to repel the first blow. The time has come when, along with an army manned by a mass of reservists and conscripts and constituting the main element of national defence, but requiring a lot of time to concentrate and put it into action, it is necessary to have a cohesive, well-trained, manoeuvrable army, capable of acting without delay. That is, an army in constant readiness for combat. I then touched upon the question of machinery. Ever since the machine has taken the dominant place in the battle order, as well as in all other spheres of human endeavour, the main factor determining the effectiveness of technique has been the high skill of those who use it. This was particularly applicable to such new means of combat resulting from the use of the motor as tanks, airplanes, and warships, which were improving very rapidly and reviving the use of manoeuvre. Henceforth there can be no doubt, I pointed out, that on land, at sea, and in the air, select cadres, able to make the most of an exceptionally powerful and varied combat equipment, have a vast superiority over weakly organised, though numerous troops. Specially selected men acting in groups in an unexpected place, at an unexpected moment and in the shortest possible time will produce a crushing effect. Referring to the political considerations that in turn determine our strategy, I pointed out that the latter cannot be limited to the defence of territory, since the field of action of French politics extends beyond our borders. Whether we like it or not, we are part of a definite system already established, all the elements of which are closely linked. Everything that happens to Central and Eastern Europe, to Belgium, to the Saar, concerns us most directly. How much blood and tears cost us the mistake of the Second Empire in allowing the defeat of Austria at Sardovia and not moving its army to the Rhine. Hence, we must be prepared to act outside our country at any moment and under any circumstances. Is it practically possible to achieve this if, in order to do anything at all, we are forced first of all to mobilise our reserves? In addition, in the resurgent rivalry between Germany and France for military supremacy in Europe, we were lagging behind the Germans in terms of troop numbers. Conversely, due to our inherent initiative, adaptability and self-love, it is we who should be ahead of her in terms of quality. I ended my answer to the question why, by saying an army designed for preventive and repressive action is what we must provide ourselves with. How to do that? Instead of the motor provided the answer to this question. A motor which can be used to transport anything, anywhere, at any speed and over any distance. A motor which, with armour protection, has such firepower and striking power that the tempo of battle matches the speed of combat vehicles. She indicated the goal to be pursues. Six linear and one light fully motorised divisions, having also tanks, will constitute an army capable of playing a decisive role. The intended organisation of such an army was defined by me quite precisely. One tank brigade of two regiments, one regiment of heavy tanks and one medium, as well as one battalion of light tanks, one motorised rifle brigade of two motorised rifle regiments and one Jäger battalion, equipped with all-terrain vehicles, one artillery brigade, having in-service guns with a circular fire, consisting of two artillery regiments and one anti-aircraft division. To support the combat operations of these three brigades, the division was to additionally include a reconnaissance regiment, a sapper battalion, a communications battalion, a camouflage battalion, and various services. The light motorised division intended for reconnaissance and long-range protection was to have faster vehicles. In addition, the army itself had to have general purpose reserves. Heavy tanks, artillery of very large calibre, sapper and camouflage equipment, means of communication. Finally, this powerful army had to have at its disposal a large force of reconnaissance, fighter and attack aviation. One aviation group for each division and one aviation regiment for the army as a whole, not counting aircraft that could be used to conduct joint aviation operations with ground motorised troops. However, in order for a shock army to be able to make full use of the opportunities provided by all this complex and expensive equipment, so that it would be ready to act at any moment, in any theatre of war, without waiting for replenishment and without needing to train its personnel, it should have been staffed with professional personnel. The total number of such an army should have been 100,000 people. 
Its units were to be staffed by volunteers, serving for six years in the selected troops. The personnel of such an army would have received good training due to the availability of equipment, the spirit of competition and camaraderie. This personnel could then be used as manpower for conscripted units and res Then I moved on to how to use such a strategic fist to break through strong enemy defences. Rapid transfer of troops to the area of combat operations, carried out during one night, which is possible thanks to the motorization of all units, their ability to move on any terrain, the use of active and passive means of camouflage, an offensive involving 3,000 tanks built in several echelons on a section of the front an average width of up to 50 kilometers. This offensive is supported by the following at a short distance from the tanks dispersed artillery on a succession of the tanks and by the use of active and passive means of camouflage. The forces involved in the operation are divided into two or three army corps. Division Air Assets and Army Aviation conduct reconnaissance and support the actions of ground troops. The tempo of the offensive as a whole, under normal conditions, should be about 50 kilometers per day. After all these actions, and in the event that the enemy continues to offer organized resistance, a general regrouping of forces follows, either to extend the breakthrough to the flanks, or to resume the offensive in depth, or finally to gain a foothold in the captured terrain. But after the breakthrough of the enemy's defences may suddenly open up wider opportunities. In this case, the mechanised army would be able to develop success fan-shaped on diverging directions. This is regard, I rose. Often, having achieved success, troops will seek to use its results and penetrate deep into the rear of the enemy. The development of success, which could only dream of, will become a reality, and then opens the way to great victories, that is, to such victories, which in their far-reaching consequences immediately lead to the complete defeat of the enemy, just as the destruction of one column sometimes entails the destruction of the entire building. Mechanized troops will rush deep into the rear of the enemy, hitting vulnerable objects and disorganizing his entire grouping. Thus, tactics will develop into strategy, which was once the ultimate goal of the art of war and the top of its perfection. Meanwhile, there may come a moment when the enemy's armed forces, the entire nation and state, driven to the extreme degree of despair and deprived of means of defense, will themselves come to a final collapse. This will be achieved the more surely and the sooner, because this ability for sudden strikes and breakthroughs is perfectly combined with the now decisive combat properties of the various types of aviation. I have written that aviation, by bombing the enemy from the air, prepares and complements the success of the combat operations conducted on the ground by the mechanized army and the latter. In turn, invading the areas devastated by aviation makes strategically expedient destructive actions of air squadrons. Such a profound change in the modes of warfare required corresponding changes in the management of troops, emphasizing that under present conditions radio permits communication between the various elements of the future army. I have outlined at the end of the book the methods which commanders must use to control the troops of this new fighting organism. I said that the time had passed when commanders from their command posts hidden deep underground directed the masses of men far away from them. On the contrary, the commander's personal presence, his decision-making on the spot, his own example, will be of the utmost importance in the rapidly developing events, with their unforeseen contingencies and instantly changing circumstances, which will characterize the battles of mechanized forces. The personality of the commander will assume an incomparably greater role than the ready-made prescriptions prescribed by regulations. Would it not be better, I asked, if the change in the conditions of battle would favor an increased role for those who, in the tragic moments when the hurricane of war sweeps away established norms and established habits, remain at their post and are therefore indispensable? In conclusion, I appeal to the public authorities. Indeed, transformations in the army, as well as in other spheres of state life, do not happen by themselves. And since the emergence of a professional army was to lead to a profound restructuring of the entire system of armed forces, as well as combat technology and strategy, the creation of such an army could only be realized by the state power. Undoubtedly, this time too, a man like Louvoilili Carnot would have been needed. But, on the other hand, such a reform could only be part of a broader transformation and only one element in the restructuring of the state. It was only natural that national renewal should have begun with the reorganization of the army. In the strenuous effort to renew France, the army would serve as her aid and example. 
For the sword is the axis of the world, and the greatness of a country is inseparable from the greatness of its army. In developing my design I have, of course, utilized the views and ideas that have become prevalent in connection with the advent of fighting machines. General Etienne, an ardent supporter of a mechanized army and the first inspector of tank troops, as early as 1917 suggested that a significant number of tanks should be used at a great distance from those tank units that are used as an escort for infantry. In this regard, at the end of 1918, factories began to produce huge combat vehicles weighing 60 tons. However, after the armistice, the production of tanks was discontinued, and the theory was reduced to the formula of coordinated action of infantry and tanks, which supplemented the formula of escort tanks. The British, who first used the Royal Tank Corps en masse in 1917 in Cambrai, were the pioneers in this field. They continued to defend the theory of independent use of armoured forces, ardent adherents of which were General Fuller, English military historian Little Garth. In France in 1933, the military command, united in the Camp Soup disparate tank units, created the Corps of a Light Division with the purpose of reconnaissance and protection. Some in this area went even further. In his book Thoughts of a Soldier, published in 1929, General von Sektu pointed to the enormous superiority that will have a well-trained army over poorly organized troops. He had in mind, on the one hand, a hundred thousand German army whose soldiers were in long-term service, and on the other hand, the numerous but, in his opinion, poorly welded French army, Italian General Dew, determining the effect that aerial bombardment of industrial and other vital centres could have, concluded that aviation alone could decide the outcome of the war. Finally, the Plan Maximum, which Paul Boncourt defended in 1932 in Geneva, envisioned the creation of a professional army under the League of Nations, putting at its disposal all the tanks and all the aviation of European countries, and entrusting to this army to ensure collective security in Europe. My plan brought all these disparate, but fundamentally unified views into a system and aimed to use them in the interests of France. My book, For a Professional Army, aroused some interest but not the slightest enthusiasm. It was regarded as a purely theoretical work to be used at will by the authorities concerned because it was seen as a presentation of highly original views. It did not occur to anyone that on the basis of these views a practical reorganization of our entire military apparatus could be effected. If I believed the time was running out, I could have limited myself to defending my concept in the circles of specialists in the expectation that the course of events would force to recognize the validity of my arguments. Meanwhile, Hitler wasted no time. Already in October 1933, he broke with the League of Nations and arbitrarily gave himself complete freedom of action in the field of armaments. Between 1934 and 1935 Germany made enormous efforts in the field of arms production and manning of its armed forces. The National Socialist regime openly declared its intention to tear up the Treaty of Versailles and to conquer the living space for a great Germany. The implementation of such a policy required a powerful striking army, and Hitler, of course, prepared a general mobilization. Soon after coming to power, he introduced labor conscription and then universal conscription. He needed a strong invasion army to cut the Gordian knots in Mainz, Vienna, Prague, Warsaw, and at one stroke thrust the German sword into the heart of France. For people knowledgeable, it was no secret that the Fury intends to educate the new German army in the spirit of his ideas. He willingly listened to the opinion of officers, supporters of rapid maneuver and a high level of training of troops, such as Keitel Rundstedt, Guerrilla, previously grouped around General von Sekt. These officers focused on the creation of powerful armored units. In addition, it was known that, sharing the views of Goering, Hitler sought to create an aviation which could closely interact with ground troops. Soon I was informed that he familiarized himself with my book, which drew the attention of his advisors. In November 1934, it became known that Germany is creating the first three tank divisions. A book by Colonel Nearing of the General Staff of the German Army, published during this period, indicated that their organization is essentially the same as that which I proposed for our future armored formations. In March 1935, Goering declared that Germany would soon have a strong air fleet, which in addition to a large number of fighters, would also include many bombers and a powerful attack aviation although each of these activities was a blatant violation of the Treaties of Versailles. 
The free world was limited to the platonic protests of the League of Nations. It was intolerable to me to see our future adversary provide himself with the means necessary to achieve victory while France was still deprived of them. Meanwhile, amidst the incredible apathy in which the nation stood, there was not a single authoritative political or military figure to raise his voice and demand that the necessary measures be taken. The matter was so serious that I did not consider myself entitled to be silent, although I was of modest position and had no great influence. The responsibility for the state of national defence lay with the government, and I decided to put the matter directly to it. First of all, I contacted André Pyrénaux, editor of the Echo de Paris, later editor-in-chief of The Age. He agreed to promote the project of creating an armoured army and to give the government no respite in this matter by constantly reminding it of the project in the pages of the major newspaper he published, linking the campaign launched to topical events. André Pyrono published 40 editorials that helped popularise the issue. Whenever events drew public attention to the problems of national defence, my confederate argued in the pages of his newspaper for the creation of a mechanised army. Since it was known that in the field of armaments the main German efforts were directed to the creation of means of attack and development of success, Pyrono intensely sounded the alarm, but his voice was drowned in the atmosphere of general indifference. Dozens of times he argued that there may come a moment when the German armoured forces with the support of aircraft can suddenly crush our defences and cause panic among our people, which can no longer be anything to contain. While André Pyrot was doing his noble work, a number of other journalists and critics were raising the same question in one way or another. Remy Ruhr and General Baratier in time, Pierre Burgett and Generals Cugnac and Duval in debate, Emile Burate and Charles Guyon in André Lecomte in dawn, Colonel Emile Meyer, Lucien Pachin, Jean Orbitin, and others in many different journals. Eventually so many solid facts accumulated that newspaper articles alone could no longer solve such an important problem. It had to be taken up by the leading political authorities of the country. I believe that Paul Reynaud was the most suitable person for this purpose. He could appreciate the importance of the problem, he had the talent to convince others and the courage to insist on its solution. In addition, Paul Reynaud, even though he was already famous at that time, gave the impression of a man with a great future. I met him, explained the problem to him, and from then on I began to work with him together. On March 15, 1935, he made a convincing speech in the Chamber of Deputies, in which he talked about why and how our armed forces should be supplemented by a first-class mechanised army. Shortly thereafter, the government introduced a bill to extend conscription to two years. Paul Reynard, in full agreement with this bill, introduced a bill for the immediate creation of a special army composed of six line and one light motorised division, general reserves and services. This army should be staffed with personnel entering the service under contract, and should be fully brought into readiness no later than April 15, 1940. For three years, Paul Reynard defended his position in numerous speeches in Parliament, which made a deep impression on the pages of his book, The French Military Problem, in vivid articles and interviews, and finally in conversations on this issue with influential political and military figures of France. Gradually he established a reputation as a resolute statesman, a man of new views, who seemed to be made to take power in a critical situation. Since I thought it would be a good idea to repeat the same tune in different voices, I tried to include other public figures in my choir. The noble mission of Apostle of the Professional Army was taken up by Lee Courier Grandmaison, who was attracted to the idea by all that was connected with French tradition. For deputies joined the ranks of its advocates. Philippe Serres, Marcel D, and Leo Lagrange, who helped to propagandise the revolutionary side of the proposed innovations. Serres, displaying a remarkable oratorical talent, did this so brilliantly that he soon entered the government, dear, on whose abilities I had particularly counted, having been defeated in the 1936 elections, took the opposite path. As for Leo Lagrange, he could not defend his convictions because of the banning by the party to which he belonged. Soon such prominent figures, as Paul Boncourt in the Chamber of Deputies and the former President of the Republic, Millerand in the Senate, made it clear to me that they too were in favour of reform. Meanwhile, the official bodies and the press, instead of recognising the obvious need for reform and going for it, continued to cling to the existing system. Unfortunately, in doing so, they were so stubborn that they closed the avenues of escape for themselves.
To discredit the idea of a mechanized army, they tried to present it in a distorted light. In order to cast doubt on technical progress, they took the path of its denial. To counteract the course of events, they tried to ignore it. By this example, I have seen that whenever the clash of different ideas and opinions requires the abandonment of habitual misconceptions and is fraught with danger to men of rank, it inevitably assumes the irreconcilable character of a theological controversy. General de Benay, the illustrious commander of the army in the war of 1914-1918, who in 1927, while chief of the general staff, drafted laws on the organization of the armed forces, strongly condemned the project put forward. In the pages of La Revue des Ducs Monde, he authoritatively asserted that any armed conflict in Europe would be finally resolved on our northeastern frontier, and that the task was to defend that frontier stubbornly. Neither in the principles of our national defence, nor in the methods of their implementation, he saw nothing that should be changed, and insisted only on strengthening the system that was based on these principles. General Weyan also spoke in the same journal. Considering a priori that my conception leads to the division of the army into two parts, he objected categorically. Two armies? Absolutely not, as for the tasks of the mechanized army of which I spoke. Weygan did not deny their expediency, but argued that these tasks can be accomplished by the means we already have. We have, he pointed out, mechanized, motorized and cavalry reserve. There is nothing to create anew, because everything is already available. Speaking in Lille on July 4, 1939, General Weygand once again stated that, from his point of view, our army does not need anything. Marshal Pétain also saw fit to speak. He did so in the preface to General Chauvinot's book, Is an Invasion Still Possible? Marshal expressed his belief that tanks and aviation do not change the nature of war, and that the basic condition for the security of France is the creation of a solid front, reinforced by fortifications. Under the signature of Jane Riviere Figaro, published a whole series of reassuring articles to her. Tanks are not invincible, the weakness of tanks, when politicians are deluded, etc. In the newspaper Mercure de France, a general writing under the pseudonym Three Stars rejected the principle of motorization of the R. The Germans, with their inherent offensive spirit, naturally must have tank divisions. But peace-loving France, which faces defensive tasks, cannot be a supporter of motorization. Other critics resorted to ridicule, because one of them wrote in a thick literary magazine. Trying to stay within the limits of courtesy, it is very difficult to assess the ideas that border on madness. To put it bluntly, Mr. de Gaulle, with his modern ideas, has a predecessor in the person of King Yu Bu, who also being a great strategist, anticipated his thought long ago. When we return from Poland, he said, we shall, thanks to our knowledge of physics, invent a wind machine capable of transporting our whole army. If the conservatives with their routine were extremely hostile to my project, the doctrinaires among the supporters of progress were no better disposed to it. In November, December 1934, in the Populaire, Leon Blumot openly declared the dislike and anxiety my plan inspired in him. In many articles, such as professional soldiers and a professional army, do we need a professional army? Down with the professional army? He also opposed the creation of a specialized army. In this case, Blum did not proceed from the interests of national defense, but acted in the name of some ideological principles, which he called democratic and republican, and which, by tradition, saw everything that came from the military as a threat to the existing regime. Leon Blum therefore anathematized the professional army which, he argued, by its composition, its spirit and its armament, would automatically be a threat to the Republic. Thus, receiving support from right and left, the official authorities stubbornly refused to change anything. Paul Raynaud's bill was rejected by the House Armed Services Commission. The relevant report, submitted by Senac and drafted, with the direct involvement of the army staff, stated that the proposed reform was useless and undesirable because it is contrary to logic and history. From the parliamentary rostrum, the Minister of War, General Morin, objected to the deputies in favour of a manoeuvrable R. Do you really think that, after spending a great deal of effort to create a fortified barrier, we will be so crazy as to go beyond that barrier and get involved in some adventure? He went on to say, I am here expressing the views of a government which, in my person at any rate, is perfectly familiar with our plan of action in case of war. This statement, which decided the fate of the mechanized army, 
at the same time told everyone in Europe who knew how to listen that France, under any circumstances, will limit herself to the advance of troops on the Maginot Line. Size might be expected, ministerial anger fell on my head. However, it did not take the character of an official condemnation, but manifested itself in the form of occasional outbursts. Once, for example, in the Elysee Palace, after one of the meetings of the Supreme Council of National Defence, of which I was secretary, General Morin addressed me with the following words. Farewell, de Gaulle, where I am, you no longer belong. When it came to talking about me, he would say to his visitors, Pirono serves as his pen and Raynaud as his gramophone. I'm sending him to Corsica, and yet General Morin only frightened me with thunder. He had the generosity not to strike me with light. Fabry, who after a time succeeded Morin in the Rue Saint-Dominique, and General Gamelin, who after General Wagan took over as chief of the general staff, while remaining at the same time at the head of the army staff, inherited from their predecessors a negative attitude to my project, and to me personally felt embarrassed and annoyed. The responsible leaders, although they defended the status quo, could not help but recognize the persuasiveness of my arguments. They were too well aware of the truth to fully believe their own objections, while claiming as if I were exaggerating the capabilities of armoured forces. They were at the same time quite concerned that Germany was building such troops. When they argued that seven strike divisions could be replaced by the same number of conventional defensive divisions, called motorised, because they were to be moved by truck, they knew better than anyone that this was simply a juggling of words. When they referred to the fact that the creation of a professional army supposedly divided our armed forces into two parts, they deliberately glossed over the fact that the law on two-year military service, enacted after my book was published, ensured that, if necessary, a large proportion of conscripted soldiers would be included in the selected army. They turned a blind eye to the fact that we have a navy, an air force, colonial troops, an African army, a field gendarmerie and a police force that exist independently within the armed forces without the slightest detriment to their unity. Finally, they overlooked the fact that the unity of national armed forces is determined not by the fact that all their elements have the same weapons and personnel, but by the fact that they all defend the same homeland, obey the same laws and serve under the same banner. It was disheartening to see the prominent figures of France, because of their misunderstood adherence to accepted norms, acting not in their proper role as demanding leaders, but as some kind of comforters. And yet I felt that deep down, under the outer cloak of their conviction that they were right, they would have been ready to embrace new possibilities. Already the first episode in a long chain of events, during which some of the best representatives of the nation, while condemning the aims I was putting forward, were in fact in despair at their inability to realise them, gave me the sad satisfaction of seeing that they were tormented by remorse. Events had run their course. Hitler, who now knew how to behave towards France, began to carry out a whole series of violent acts already in 1935, in connection with a pebiscite in the Sayar region. He created such a threatening atmosphere that the French government prudently decided to withdraw from the game, and the population of the Sayar, frightened by the pressure of the German, in a huge majority in favour of joining Germany. Mussolini. For his part, thanks to the support of the government Lavallee's tolerance cabinet Baldwin, not afraid of the sanctions of Geneva, began the conquest of Abyssinia. On March 7, 1936, the German army suddenly crossed the Rhine and invaded the demilitarized zone. The Treaty of Versailles forbade German troops access to the territories on the left bank of the Rhine, which were demilitarized under the Locarno Agreement. According to the treaty, we had the right to reoccupy these territories as soon as Germany withdrew its signature from the agreement. If we had by that time at least partially created a tank army with its fast-moving fighting machines and personnel ready to march immediately, the natural course of events would have moved this army to the Rhine, since our allies, the Poles, Czechs and Belgians, were ready to support us and the British had pledged to do so even earlier, Hitler would undoubtedly have had to retreat. Indeed, he had just embarked on an army rearmament program and was not yet in a position to fight a large-scale war. For Hitler's political career in his own country, a French defeat in the territory at this time could have had fatal consequences. By taking such a risk, he could have lost all at once. But he won it all. The organisation of our national defence, the character of its means, its spirit, all contributed to the inaction of our government, which by its nature willingly followed the path of non-intervention. 
since we were prepared only for the defense of our frontier and under no circumstances allowed the possibility of crossing it. There could be no doubt that France would not oppose German expansion. The Führer was sure of it. The whole world had stated it. Instead of forcing Germany to withdraw her troops from the Rhineland by threatening military force, she was given the opportunity to occupy the area without a single shot and take positions directly on the borders of France and Belgium. And after that, the deeply offended Foreign Minister Flandin could go to London to find out the intentions of the British. Prime Minister Soralt, for his part, could declare that the French government will not allow Strasbourg to be within range of German guns. French diplomacy could seek a principled condemnation of Hitler from the League of Nations. All these were empty words and aimless posturing in the face of fait accompli. It seemed to me that the public anxiety caused by the occupation of the Rhineland might prove salutary for France. The government could take advantage of it to fill up gaps in the national defence which were fraught with deadly danger. Although all the attention of the country was absorbed by the elections and the ensuing social and political crisis, everyone agreed on the need to strengthen the country's defence. Had all efforts been directed towards building exactly the kind of army we lacked, much more could have been averted. But nothing was done. The considerable war credits received in 1936 were used to improve the existing system, not to change it. I had not yet lost hope, however. In the midst of the incredible ferment that prevailed in the country at that period, which found political expression in the elections and in Parliament, in the form of a combination called the Popular Front, there was, it seemed to me, a certain psychological element in this atmosphere which made it possible to end passivity. It was natural to assume that in the face of the triumph of National Socialism in Berlin, the domination of Fascism in Rome, the advance on Madrid of the Phalanx soldiers, the French Republic would wish to restructure both its social structure and its military organization. In October 1936, the President of the Council of Ministers, Leon Blum, invited me to his house. Our conversation took place on the evening of the same day when the Belgian King announced that he was breaking the alliance with France and England. He reasoned that in case Germany should attack his country, this alliance would not be able to defend it. Indeed, he declared, with the present capabilities of the tank armies, we would be alone under any circumstances. Leon Blum fervently assured me that he took great interest in my ideas. However, I remarked, you have fought against them. When you become head of a government, one's outlook changes, he replied. At first we talked about what might happen if Hitler should, as was to be supposed, march on Vienna, Prague or Warsaw. Very simply, I remarked, depending on the situation, we will call up men either from the first line reserve or from the reserves. And then, looking through the embrasures of our fortifications, we shall contemplate idly the enslavement of Europe. How? exclaimed Leon Blum. Are you in favour of our sending an expeditionary corps, PM to Austria, Bohemia or Poland? No, I replied. But if the Weir marked his advancing along the Danube or the Elbe, why don't we advance to the Rhine? Why don't we enter the Ruhr if the Germans go to the Vistula? After all, if we were in a position to take such countermeasures, surely this alone would be sufficient to prevent the development of aggression. But under our present system, we are unable to move from the spot. On the contrary, the presence of a tank army would encourage us to act. Wouldn't the government feel more confident if it were prepared for this in advance? The Prime Minister readily agreed with me, but remarked, it would certainly be unfortunate if our friends in Central and Eastern Europe were to fall victim to an invasion. In the final analysis, however, Hitler will achieve nothing until he defeats us. And how can he do that? You would agree that our system, little suited to offensive action, is brilliantly adapted to defence. I have been proving that this is not at all true. Recalling the statement issued in the morning by Leopold II, I remarked that it was precisely because of the military superiority of the Germans, in view of our lack of a select mechanised army, that we had lost our alliance with Belgium. The head of government did not object, although he thought that the position of Brussels was not due to strategic considerations alone. At any rate, he said, our defensive line and fortifications will be able to secure our territory. Nothing could be more doubtful, I replied. Already in 1918 there were no insurmountable defences. And what progress has been made since then in the development of tanks and aviation? In the future, the massive use of a sufficient number of fighting machines 
will make it possible to break through any defensive barrier in a selected area. And as soon as the gap is made, the Germans will be able, with the support of aviation to move into our deep rear mass of their fast-moving tanks. If we will have tanks in equal numbers, everything can be fixed. If not, all will be lost. The Prime Minister informed me that the government, with the approval of Parliament, had decided, in addition to the usual budgetary allocations, to spend large sums of money on national defence, and that a large part of this money would be devoted to the production of tanks and aircraft. I drew his attention to the fact that, of the aircraft whose production had been provided for, nearly all were for defence and not for attack. As for tanks, nine-tenths were supposed to create a car brand Renault and Gotchkiss, Model 1935, which, although modernised, still have a lot of weight, low speed, armed with a small-calibre short-barrelled gun, and are designed to accompany infantry, and not at all to perform independent tasks as part of special tank formation. However, no one is thinking about this. As a result, our military organisation will remain as it was. We will build, I said, the same number of tanks and spend as much money as it would take to create a tank army, and yet we will not have this army. How the credits appropriated to the War Ministry are used, remarked the Prime Minister, is Daladu General Gamelin's business. Undoubtedly, I replied. I allow myself to observe, however, that the state of national defence is the responsibility of the government. During our conversation that a telephone rang ten times, Leon Blum was distracted by minor parliamentary and administrative matters. As I was about to leave, the phone rang again. Leon Blum made a tired gesture and said, Judge for yourself whether it is easy for the head of the government to stick to your plan if he cannot concentrate on the same thing for five minutes. I soon learned that although our conversation had made a strong impression on the Prime Minister, he had no intention of shaking the foundations of the building and that the previously envisioned plan would not be changed. Henceforth our chances of balancing our military forces in time with the new German capabilities seemed to me very elusive. I was convinced that Hitler's character, his outlook, his age and the excitement into which he had brought the German people compelled him to act without delay. Things would now move so fast that France would no longer be able to eliminate its lag, even if its leaders wanted to. May 1, 1937, at the parade in Berlin for the first time, took part fully staffed tank division and hundreds of aircraft. And the spectators, and above all on the French ambassador Francois Ponsi and our attaches. This military equipment gave the impression of such a powerful force, which can only be opposed by an equal force but their reports did not force the French government to reconsider earlier decisions. On March 11, 1938, Hitler carried out the Anschluss of Austria. He threw on Vienna mechanized division, the mere sight of which inclined the Austrians to unconditional submission. Together with this division, he by the evening of the same day victoriously entered the Austrian capital. France did not draw any conclusions for itself from Hitler's invasion of a neutral country. All efforts were used to console the public with ironic descriptions of the accidents suffered by several German tanks during this forced march. Nor were lessons learned from the experience of the Spanish Civil War, where Italian tanks and German attack aircraft, even in very limited numbers, decided the outcome of the battle wherever they appeared. In September 1938, with the consent of London and then Paris, Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, three days before the agreement in Munich, speaking at Berlin's Sport Palace, the Reich Chancellor dotted all the I's, causing a storm of enthusiastic cheering and enthusiasm. Now, he shouted, I can openly declare what you all already know. We have created armaments such as the world has never seen before. On March 15, 1939, he secured a surrender from President Gahapolna and occupied Prague the same day. Then on September 1, Hitler turned against Poland. In all the acts of this tragedy, France played the role of a victim waiting for her turn to come. These events did not surprise me, but made me extremely sad. In 1937, I taught at the School of Advanced Officer Training, after which I was appointed commander of the 507th Tank Regiment in Metz. The busyness of the regiment and the distance from Paris deprived me of the necessary conditions and connections to continue the struggle I had begun. In addition, in the spring of 1938, Paul Reynaud became a member of Daladier's cabinet, first as Minister of Justice and then as Minister of Finance. Not to mention the fact that from now on he was bound by ministerial solidarity, 
Now all the attention of the minister was absorbed by the urgent tasks of restoring economic and financial balance in the country. But the main point was that the government's insistence on defending a defensive military system while the Germans were showing extreme dynamism in Europe, the blindness of a political regime preoccupied with trifles in the face of a Germany ready to lash out at us, the stupidity of the sloths who welcomed the Munich surrender. All this was essentially the result of a profound national self-abasement against which I was powerless. And yet in 1938, anticipating the coming storm, I published a book entitled France and Her Army. In it I showed how for centuries the army had been a mirror in which the soul of the country and its future were invariably reflected. It was my last warning, which I addressed from my humble post to the motherland on the eve of disaster. When in September 1939 the French government, following the example of the British cabinet, decided to enter the war in Poland, which had already begun. I had no doubt at all that the illusions of the statesmen prevailed that, in spite of the state of war, it would not come to serious fighting. As commander of the tanked troops of the 5th Army in Alsace, I was not at all surprised at the utter inactivity of our mobilized forces, while Poland was defeated within two weeks by armored divisions and air squadrons of the Germans. The intervention of the Soviet Union undoubtedly hastened the defeat of the Poles, but in the position Stalin took, unexpectedly acting in concert with Hitler, clearly manifested his conviction that France would not budge and Germany would thus have a free hand, and it was better to share the spoils with her than to be her victim. While the enemy's forces were almost entirely occupied on the Vistula, we, except for a few demonstrative actions, did nothing to reach the Rhine, nor did we do anything to disarm Italy which could have been accomplished by offering her a choice between the threat of French military invasion and concessions in return for her neutrality. We did nothing, finally, to unite with Belgium by advancing our forces to Liège and the Albert Canal. In addition, the official military leadership considered this wait-and-see policy to be a very successful strategy. Speaking on the radio and in the press, members of the government, especially the head of the government, as well as many other prominent political and military figures, emphasized the advantages of a stable defense, thanks to which, they said, we are able to maintain our territorial integrity without loss. Tiaque, editor-in-chief of Le Figaro, Brisson, who visited me in Vangenberg, asked my opinion on the matter. When I deplored the inaction of our armed forces, he exclaimed, Is it not clear to you that the waters of the Marne will now no longer be red with blood? One day in January. While in Paris, I attended a dinner at Paul Reynaud's in the Rue de Rivoli, where I met Leon Blum. What is your prognosis? He addressed me. The whole question now is whether the Germans will strike in the spring in the west to capture Paris, or in the east to reach Moscow. You think so? Leon Blum was surprised. Will the Germans strike eastward? But what would be the point of them getting bogged down in the vast Russian expanse? Do you think they will rush westward? But they are powerless against the Maginot Line. When President Lebrun came to the Fifth Army, I showed him my tanks. I'm familiar with your ideas, he said kindly, but apparently it is too late for the enemy to make use of them. In fact, it was too late for us. Still, on January 26, I tried one last effort. I sent a memorandum to 80 of the most prominent members of the government, political and military. I endeavored to convince them that the enemy would undertake an offensive with a powerful mechanized army and a strong air force and that our front could therefore be broken through at any moment. Since we do not have at our disposal equivalent means to repel the enemy, we may be defeated, so it is necessary to immediately decide on the creation of these means. Simultaneously, with the production of appropriate types of weapons, must be urgently reduced to a single mechanized reserve those of the already existing or forming units that could at worst enter its composition. I ended the memorandum with the following words. The French people should by no means be under any illusion that the present abandonment of the offensive doctrine by our armed forces is in keeping with the nature of the war which has begun. Quite the contrary. The motor gives the modern means of destruction such power, such speed, such radius of action, that the war already begun will sooner or later, in the scope and rapidity of manoeuvre, in the power of surprise attacks, in the scale of invasion and pursuit of the enemy, far surpass all that has been most remarkable from this point of view in the past? Make no mistake. The war that has begun may become the most widespread, the most complex, and the most brutal of wars that have ever ravaged the earth. The political, economic, social, and moral crisis it has created is of such a profound and comprehensive nature 
that it will inevitably lead to a fundamental upheaval in the status of peoples and in the structure of nations. In an incomprehensible harmony of things, an army of motors is becoming the instrument of this upheaval, quite in keeping with its gigantic scale. It is high time for France to draw a conclusion from this. My memorandum did not cause a sensation, but the ideas I expressed and the obviousness of the facts themselves began to have some effect. By the end of 1939, two light mechanized divisions had been created. A third division was in the process of formation, but these two were formations designed for cover. They could be very useful as assets attached to armored forces and used for reconnaissance, but were ineffective in other capacities. On December 2, 1938, at the urging of General Billiot, the French Supreme Military Council decided to create two armored divisions. One of them was formed in early 1940, the second was supposed to be formed in March. These divisions were equipped with 30-ton tanks of Type B, the first samples of which were created 15 years ago. Finally, they were produced about 300 pieces. However, in terms of combat power, each of these divisions, regardless of the quality of combat vehicles, was very far from what I proposed. It was decided to include 120 tanks. I was talking about 500. It had only one battalion of motorized infantry, transported by vehicles, while according to my plan they should have seven and equipped with all-terrain vehicles. The division included two artillery divisions, but I believed that it should include seven divisions armed with guns with a circular fire. The division was not supposed to include a reconnaissance battalion. I thought it was necessary. And finally, I had in mind to use mechanized troops exclusively as an independent force, based on which their organization and command was built. Here we were talking about something else. It was intended to attach armored divisions to the various army corps of the previous type. In other words, the intention was to dissolve them in the general combat order. In the field of politics, they were equally timid and hesitant attempts to make some changes as in the organization of national defense. The state of serene tranquility which had seized the governing circles at the beginning of the strange war began to fade. The mobilization of millions of men, the diversion of industry to the production of armaments and large military expenditures were causing a ferment in the country, the results of which were becoming more than obvious to the anxious politicians. At the same time, there was no sign of the gradual weakening of the enemy, which was so much expected from the blockade. No one openly advocated a new military policy for which the necessary means were not available, but everyone expressed alarm and caustically criticized the previous policy. In the end, as usual, a government crisis erupted. The regime, unable to take measures that would provide salvation, tried to deceive itself and public opinion. On March 21, the parliament resigned Daladier's cabinet. On March 23, Paul Reynaud formed a new government. The new prime minister summoned me to Paris. On his instructions, I wrote a clear and concise declaration to be read out in parliament, which he fully approved. Various intrigues were already brewing behind the scenes. At this period, I happened to be at the Bourbon Palace and to be present at the meeting where the government was presented to Parliament. It was a terrible meeting. After the head of the government made the government declaration to the sceptical and gloomy deputies, the debate began. In the course of it, representatives of factions and individuals who felt themselves bypassed by yet another ministerial combination spoke. The danger of the homeland, the necessity of national effort, the assistance of the free world, all these were mentioned only to clothe their claims to power and their bitterness. Leon Blum, who also did not get a place in the government, was the only orator who spoke with an up. Thanks to him, Paul Reynaud, though with great difficulty, still gained the upper hand. The government received a vote of confidence by a majority of one vote. I am not yet quite sure. The president of the chamber, Harriot, told me afterward that this vote was really obtained. Before returning to my duty station at Vangenberg, I spent a few days with the Prime Minister at Quai d'Orsay. This was time enough to see to what degree of demoralization the ruling regime had reached. In all parties, in the press and in public institutions, in business and trade union circles, very influential factions were openly inclined to the idea that the war must be stopped. People in the know claimed that this opinion was also held by Marshal Pitain, former ambassador to Madrid, who allegedly knew through the Spaniards that the Germans would willingly accept an agreement. Everywhere it was sigh. If Reynaud falls, the power will take Laval, next to whom will be Pétain. 
Indeed, the marshal will be able to force the command to conclude an armistice. A leaflet with three images of Pitain was distributed in thousands of copies. First, he was depicted as a military leader, the victor of the First World War. Under the picture was written, Yesterday, a great soldier, under the second drawing, in which he was depicted in the form of an ambassador, was the caption today. A great diplomat. And finally, in the third drawing, he was depicted very large, but in some indeterminate way, under the drawing was written, And tomorrow. It must be said that some circles saw Stalin as the enemy rather than Hitler. They were more preoccupied with how to strike the USSRR, the question of helping Finland, bombing Baku or landing troops in Istanbul, than with the question of how to deal with Germany. Many people openly admired Mussolini. Even in the government, some were in favour of France gaining the Duce's favour by ceding to Djibouti and Chad to him and agreeing to the creation of a Franco-Italian condominium in Tunisia. For their part, the communists who had been making a big fuss about the national interest while Berlin was at odds with Moscow began to denigrate the capitalist war as soon as Molotov agreed with Ribbentrop. As for the completely disoriented masses, who felt that nothing and no one at the head of the state was able to direct events, they were in a state of doubt and uncertainty. It was clear that a serious trial would cause a wave of despair and terror in the country, which could destroy everything. In such a tense atmosphere, Paul Reynaud tried to assert his power. The situation was further complicated by the fact that he was in constant conflict with Daladier, his predecessor as head of government, who, however, entered Reynaud's cabinet as Minister of National Defence and Minister of War. But this strange situation could not be changed. For the Radical Party, without whose support the cabinet could not exist, insisted that its leader should remain in the government, hoping at the first opportunity to lead the cabinet again. On the other hand, Paul Reynaud, wishing to expand the tiny government majority, tried to dispel the prejudice with which moderate politicians regarded him. It was very difficult to do this, since a large part of the right wing sought peace with Hitler and an agreement with Mussolini. Thus, the president of the Council of Ministers was forced to entrust the post of Secretary of State to Paul Baudouin, a very influential man in these circles, and appointed him secretary of the newly established military committee, Paul Reynaud intended to entrust this post to me, the military committee which dealt with the conduct of the war, and therefore included the heads of the main ministries, as well as the commanders of the land, army, navy and air force, could play a very important role. To prepare various matters for discussion in the military committee, to participate in its meetings, to report its decisions, and to supervise their implementation, these were the duties of the secretary. Much may have depended on how these duties were discharged. But while Paul Reynaud seemed willing to entrust the performance of these duties to me, Daladier did not agree to this. He is the representative of the Prime Minister who came to him in the Rue Saint-Dominique to inform him of this intention of the head of government. He replied bluntly, If de Gaulle comes here, I leave this office. Go downstairs and tell Reynaud by telephone to put him in my place. Daladier was not at all hostile to me. He had proved this in his time when, as minister, he had decided to put me on the list of persons to be submitted to the next proceedings, which was obstructed in every possible way by various departmental intriguers. But Daladier, who for many years was responsible for the state of national defence, too accustomed to the existing system, feeling that not today tomorrow events will pass judgment on this system, understanding in advance all the consequences of this and believing that it is too late to undertake reorganisation anyway, he nevertheless clung to his old positions more stubbornly than ever. And for me to take the post of secretary of the military committee against the wishes of the Minister of National Defence was, of course, impossible. So I went to the front again. Before leaving, I visited General Gamelin, who summoned me to his headquarters in the Chateau de Vincennes. He lived there like a hermit. He had only a few officers under him, and he worked and pondered without interfering in current affairs. Command of the Northeastern Front Gamelin entrusted General Georges. This could continue so long as calm reigned on the front, but it would certainly become impossible if fighting broke out. General Georges himself with part of his staff was stationed at La ferti sors while other departments, headed by the Chief of Staff of the Commander-in-Chief, General Dumancamp, were located in Montreuil. The headquarters of the General Command was thus divided into three parts. In his Vincennes retreat, General Gamelin gave me the impression of a scientist who, confined in a laboratory, combines the various elements of his strategy. 
First of all, he told me that he intended to increase the number of armoured divisions from two to four, and informed me of his decision to entrust me with the command of the 4th Armoured Division, which should be formed by May 15. Regardless of my feelings about our apparently hopeless backwardness with regard to mechanised troops, it was very flattering for me, then Colonel, to be given command of the division. I mentioned this to General Gamelin. He replied, I understand your satisfaction. As for your anxiety, I think there is no reason for it. The Commander-in-Chief outlined to me the situation as he envisioned it. Having opened the map, on which was drawn the disposition of the enemy and our troops, he said that in the near future he expects an offensive of the Germans in Europe. In his opinion, this offensive should be directed mainly against Holland and Belgium, in order to reach the Pass de Calais and cut us off from the British. On the basis of various indications, he assumed that before this, the enemy would undertake a diversion or diversionary operation in the direction of the Scandinavian countries. Gaiman not only considered the disposition of our troops quite reliable, but also believed in their high fighting qualities. More than that, he was pleased that they will have to fight, and even looked forward to this moment. Listening to him, I was convinced that this man, who embodied a certain military system and had worked hard to develop it, had boundless faith in its merits. It also seemed to me that looking to the example of Joffre, whose closest assistant and partly whose inspiration he had been at the beginning of the First World War, General Gamelin was convinced that the most important thing in his position is to once and for all to adopt a certain plan, and then under no circumstances to deviate from it. A man of great and delicate mind, great self-control. He, of course, had no doubt that in the approaching battle he will ultimately win the victory. With a sense of respect, but at the same time, and some annoyance, I left this outstanding commander confined in his cell, who was to bear great responsibility and put everything at stake in a game, as I believed doomed to defeat. Five weeks later, a thunderstorm broke. On May 10, the enemy, having previously captured Denmark and almost all of Norway, began a major offensive to the west. Everywhere the offensive was led by mechanised troops and aviation. The main forces followed them, but at no time they were not put into serious fighting. In two groups, under the command of Gotaikleist, ten armoured and six motorised divisions rushed westward. Seven of the ten armoured divisions, having passed the Ardennes, three days later came to the River Mars. On May 14, they forced it at Dinan, Givet, Montemay and Sedan. Their actions were constantly supported and covered by four motorised divisions and accompanied by attack aircraft. German bombers destroyed railroad lines and road junctions in our rear, thus paralysing our transport. On May 18, having passed the Maginot Line, broken through our battle orders and destroyed one of our armies, these seven armoured divisions concentrated around St. Quentin, ready to move on Paris or on Dunkirk at any moment. Meanwhile, the remaining three armoured divisions, accompanied by two motorised divisions operating in Holland and Brabant, brought disorder and confusion in the ranks of the Dutch, Belgian, British and two French armies, totalling 800,000 men. It can be said that within a week, the outcome of the battles on the Western Front was predetermined. Army, state apparatus, the whole of France now with dizzying speed rolled down the inclined plane as a result of a fatal mistake. Meanwhile, the French army had 3,000 modern tanks and 800 armoured cars. The Germans had no more, but in accordance with the plan, we had them dispersed to separate sections of the front. In addition, by their design and armament, they were not suitable to act as a manoeuvring force. Even those few armoured divisions which we had were put into battle in isolation from each other. The three light mechanised divisions sent for reconnaissance purposes to Liege and Breda were soon forced to withdraw and take up defences. The 1st Armoured Division, which was attached to an army corps and thrown into a counter-attack west of Namia on May 16, was surrounded and destroyed. On the same day units of the 2nd Armoured Division, moved by rail to the Arzen area, were drawn into the flow of general chaos as they were unloaded. The forces of the newly formed 3rd Armoured Division were immediately distributed among battalions of one of the infantry divisions and had been bogged down in an unsuccessful counter-attack south of Sedan the day before. If these armoured divisions had been united in advance, even with all their imperfections, they could have inflicted heavy blows on the invader, but they acted in isolation from each other, and six days after the beginning of the German offensive under the onslaught of German tank columns from them survived only pitiful remnants. Guessing about the actual state of affairs on the basis of the scraps of information that reached me, I would have given a lot to turn out that I was wrong in my guesses. 
But in a battle, even a lost one, a soldier no longer belongs to himself. In turn, and I found myself entirely at the mercy of events. May 11, I received the order to take command of the 4th Armoured Division, which however did not yet exist, but some of its units, arriving from somewhere far away, were to gradually come to my disposal. From Vezin, where my command post was located, I was summoned to the Commander-in-Chief's headquarters to receive a combat assignment. I was familiarized with it by the Chief of Staff of the Commander-in-Chief General Du Manc. This task was very difficult. Command told me the General we wants to create a front of defense along the rivers Enne and Ilet to block the way to Paris. On this front will be deployed the 6th Army, formed from units withdrawn from the eastern section of the front. It will be commanded by General Tuchain. The task of your division is to move forward and act independently in the Leon area, to ensure the gain of time necessary for its deployment. It's the commander of the Northeastern Front, General Georges, relies entirely on you to select the means necessary to accomplish this task. You will report directly to him and to no one else. Communication with him will be provided by Major Chomel. Receiving me, General Georges was calm, friendly, but clearly depressed. He told me what he wanted me to do and added, get down to business, de Gaulle. For you who have long expressed ideas which the enemy is carrying out, an opportunity to act is presented. The proper authorities hastened, as far as possible, to send to the neighbourhood of Leon the units intended for me. I should note that during these terrible days, when sudden enemy attacks led to a continuous change of situation and had to deal with countless issues related to the movement and transfer of troops, the headquarters excelled in its task. However, it was felt that hope was running out and that the spring had already burst. I rushed to Leon, set up my command post in the southeastern part of the city of Bruyers, familiarizing myself with the surroundings. So of the French troops I found in this area only scattered units of the 3rd Cavalry Division, a handful of people holding the fortress of Leon, and accidentally stuck here the 4th Independent Artillery Division, ordered to use chemical agents if necessary. I joined these young men, armed with single carbines, and assigned them to guard along the Sisson Canal. The same evening the enemy's reconnaissance came in contact with them. On May 16, together with members of my fledgling headquarters, I made reconnaissance and gathered the necessary information. I had the impression that a large force of Germans who came out of the Ardennes through Rocroi and Meziers are moving not south, but west, to Canton, covering their left flank side guard advanced to the area south of the River Seer. On all the roads coming from the north, there was an endless stream of wagons of unfortunate refugees. Among them were many unarmed soldiers. They belonged to the units that had fled in disorderly flight as a result of the rapid advance of German tanks during the last few days. Along the way, they were overtaken by enemy mechanized units and ordered to drop their rifles and move south, so as not to clutter the roads. We don't have time to take you prisoners, they were told, at the sight of the panic-stricken men, the disorderly retreating army, hearing accounts of the outrageous insolence of the enemy, I felt a boundless indignation growing within me. Oh, how ridiculous it all is. The war is off to a very bad start. Well, it must go on. There's plenty of room on earth for that. As long as I live, I will fight wherever it is necessary, for as long as it is necessary, until the enemy is defeated and the national shame is washed away. It was on that day that I made a decision which prefigured all my future activities. First of all, I decided that tomorrow morning I would attack by any means at my disposal. Advancing 20 kilometers in a northeasterly direction, I would try to reach Montcornet on the River Serre, the junction of the roads leading to Saint-Quentin, Léon, and Rio. By doing so, I will cut the first of these, so that the enemy can no longer use it to advance westward and ride the other two which might otherwise give the enemy an opportunity to approach directly to the defensive positions of the 6th Army. At dawn on May 17, I received three tank battalions. One of them had B tanks and was reinforced by a tank company that included D2 tanks. It was part of the 6th Half Brigade. The other two battalions had Reynolds 35 tanks and were part of the 8th Semi Brigade. At dawn, I moved these forces forward. Opposing on their way the enemy units already invading the area, they reached Moncornet. Until evening my battalions fought on the outskirts and then in the village itself, suppressing many pockets of enemy resistance and firing their guns at German units trying to pass through Moncornet. However, the Riverser enemy held very firmly. Our tanks, deprived of any support, could not, of course, force it. 
In the afternoon, the 4th Jager Battalion arrived. Barely had it time to unload, but I immediately used it to eliminate in the area of Shiva enemy vanguard, which missed our tanks and then found itself. This task was quickly accomplished. But from the northern bank of the river, sir, we were shelled by German artillery, while ours was not even yet established in firing positions. All the second half of the day, German bombers continuously appeared in the air and from diving flight, bombed our tanks and vehicles. We had nothing to answer with. Finally, increasingly frequent and more numerous mechanized units of the enemy began to operate in our rear. Having moved 30 kilometers forward beyond the River N, we were alone in our section, and it was necessary to end this at least risky situation. As night fell, I assigned the task to the newly arrived 10U Quirassia Reconnaissance Regiment of medium tanks to come into direct contact with the enemy and sent tanks and infantry to Shiva. Hundreds of dead German soldiers and many burned enemy vehicles could be seen everywhere. We captured 130 prisoners. Our losses did not amount to 200 men. Along the rear roads, the flow of refugees stopped. Some of these unfortunates even began to go back, for the rumor had spread among them that the French troops had advanced. Now it was necessary to act no longer to the northeast, but to the north of Lyon, because significant enemy forces coming from the area of Mal moved along the river Seer to the west, on La Fere. At the same time, German side guard units began to move southward, threatening to reach the Elit River. The 4th Armoured Division used the night of 1819 May to take up positions on the northern edge of Lyon. In the meantime, I received reinforcements. The 3rd Cirassia Regiment, consisting of two squadrons of Somway tanks and the 322nd Artillery Regiment with two divisions of 75mm guns. In addition, the commander of the 3rd Light Cavalry Division, General Petier, promised to support me with fire from his guns, which occupied positions on the height of Leon. True, of the 150 tanks, which I had, there were only 30 vehicles Type B, armed with 75mm gun, and about 40 vehicles Type D2 or brand some Ewer with small calibre 47mm guns, and all other tanks Renault 30 at 37mm guns, capable of effective fire at a distance of no more than 600 metres. However, the crews of the Samoys tanks were led by commanders who had never fired guns before, and the drivers had a total of no more than four hours of tank driving experience. To make matters worse, the division had only one infantry battalion transported by buses, and therefore extremely vulnerable in transfers. In addition, the artillery was staffed with units from a wide variety of fleets, and many officers got to know their soldiers literally on the battlefield. In addition, we had no radio communications, and I had to command the division by giving orders to subordinate commanders through motorcycle liaisons or by going to units in person. To top it all off, all units were extremely short of transportation, supplies and repairs, which under normal conditions they should have had. And yet these hastily assembled troops were filled with fighting spirit. Forward, the sources of energy were not yet exhausted. May 19 at dawn into battle. Tank's division, overcoming a number of consecutive boundaries, moved to Creasy, Mortier and Pulley. They had to seize the bridges and block the enemy's way to La Fiere. The tanks were accompanied by artillery. A reconnaissance regiment and an infantry battalion provided cover for the right flank on the riverside at Barrington. In the direction of Marl was sent out reconnaissance. The morning passed safely. We reached the Sur River, turning to flight various enemy units that had infiltrated the area. But on the north bank of the river, the enemy occupied the defences. He firmly held the crossings and destroyed our tanks that tried to approach them. Heavy artillery of the enemy entered the battle. We came into contact with large formations of the Germans, moving to saint Cantine To force the water barrier and move forward tanks, we lacked infantry and powerful artillery. At these moments, I could not help but think what would be capable of a mechanised army, which I have so long dreamed of. If I now had such an army to suddenly break out to guise, would immediately be stopped the advance of the German panzer divisions, their rear would be covered with confusion, the northern army group could reconnect with the armies of the central and eastern fronts. However, our forces in the area north of Leon is extremely negligible. Therefore, the Germans managed to force the river Sir. Even the day before they began to cross it at Munkhorn, which we have already left, and since noon crossed also at the point of Mar. They attacked our right flank on the river at Barrington and our rear at Chambry, throwing into the offensive a large number of tanks, self-propelled guns, 
mortars on vehicles and motorized infantry. And then there were their dive bombers. They made raids until the night, holding at risk vehicles that could not move off the roads, and openly located artillery pieces. In the afternoon I received orders from General Georges to cease resistance. The deployment of the 6th Army was completed, and my division was to be immediately utilized for other tasks. I decided to delay the enemy for another day, for which purpose I concentrated the division around Vorge, in order to be able to give the Germans a flank blow if they tried to advance from Leon to Reims or to Soissons. The crossing of the Eni postponed until the next day. Regrouping was organized, although everywhere the enemy tried to attack us. All night at the exits from the area of the troops did not see skirmishes. On May 20, the 4th Armoured Division moved out in the direction of Fim and Bren. It had to move literally among the Germans, which swarmed all the roads. The enemy had many strongholds here, and a large number of German tanks attacked our columns. Thanks to our tanks, which gradually cleared the roads and approaches, we reached the Enn River relatively safely. However, the reconnaissance regiment, which together with one tank battalion, formed the rear guard, with great difficulty managed to get out of Festia. In the heights of Crayon, the division's transports came under heavy fire and were forced to abandon their trucks, which were engulfed in flames. While the 4th Armoured Division was operating in the Leon area, to the north of that area events were developing with the same rapidity with which the German tank columns were advancing. German command, having decided to destroy the Allied armies of the Northern Group before the troops of the Central and Eastern Fronts were finished, moved their mechanized forces to Dunkirk. From St. Cantin, they again launched the offensive in two columns. One went straight to the objective through Camber and Dewey, the other moved along the coast through Etaples and Boulogne. Meanwhile, two armored divisions of the enemy seized Amiens and Abbeville and created on the south bank of the Somme pre-bridge fortifications, which were used in the future. As for the Allies, by the evening of May 20, the Dutch army no longer existed. The Belgian troops retreated to the west. The British expeditionary force together with the first French army was cut off from France. The French command undoubtedly sought to restore contact between the two groups of its forces, moving on the offensive northern army group from Arras to Amiens and the left flank of the central group, from Amiens to Arras. This was the order given by General Gamelin on May 19. His replacement on May 20, General Weygand, who the next day was going to go to Belgium, agreed with this plan. Theoretically, this plan was quite logical, but for its realisation, the command itself had to believe in the possibility of victory and strive to achieve it. However, the collapse of the entire military doctrine and organisational principles of our leaders deprived them of the necessary energy. Being in a state of moral depression, they began to doubt decisively in everything and especially in themselves, and then immediately centrifugal forces began to act. The Belgian king immediately began to think of surrender. Lord Gort to pack evacuation of British troops, General Weygand, the armistice. While in the midst of total defeat began the breakdown of command, the 4th Armoured Division was moving westward. At first the question was put so that it would force the summon and lead the offensive, which was scheduled to be carried out in a northerly direction. But this idea was abandoned. It was then intended to use it with other forces to repel the Germans who crossed the Somme at Amiens, but to participate in this operation, the division was not involved, but for this purpose was taken one of its tank battalions. Finally, on the night of 26 to 27 May, the division commander, made two days before in the generals, received from General Robert Altmaier, commander of the 10th Army, combining forces hastily concentrated in the area of the lower reaches of the sun. The order to immediately go in the direction of Abbeville and attack the enemy, created south of the city, stubbornly defended Bridgehead. By this time, the division was stationed around Granvilliers, having set out on May 22 and passing through Fim, Soissons, Villers, Cotra, Compiègne, Montdidier, Beauvars. The division for five days covered a distance of 180 kilometers. It can be said that since its birth on the fields of Montcornet, the division was continuously in combat or on the march. This affected the condition of the tanks, of which about 30 were out of service. But on the way we received excellent replenishment. A battalion of tanks typed BA battalion of 20-ton tanks of the D2 type, which unfortunately I had to leave in the Amiens area. The 7th Motorized Dragoon Regiment, a division of 105mm guns, a battery of anti-aircraft guns, five batteries of 47mm anti-tank guns, 
With the exception of the 19th Battalion, all units were formed hastily. But the fighting spirit that reigned in the division embraced the personnel of these units immediately upon arrival at the site. Finally, to fulfill the newly assigned task, I received at my disposal the 22nd Colonial Infantry Regiment and Artillery of the 2nd Cavalry Division. A total of 140 serviceable tanks and six infantry battalions, supported by six artillery divisions, were to strike at the southern section of the German bridgehead. I made the decision to attack that evening, since the German Air Force had not stopped tracking the division, and the only chance to use the effect of surprise was to force an attack. The Germans were indeed waiting for us in full readiness, for a week already, defending a front to the south and occupying the village of Yuppie on their western flank, and the point of Brili Mariu on the Sami on their eastern flank. They had held the groves of Limieu and Bale between these points. Behind, the Germans fortified the points of Bienfires, Villers, Duchenville, and Ma Finally, the height of Montcober, located on the same bank of the summer and dominating Abbeville and its bridges, served as a fortified point deep in the enemy's defences. Consistently seize these three lines, such a task I set before the division. The division entered the battle at 18 hours. Six half brigade of heavy tanks with the 4th Jager Battalion attacked Yuppie. Eight half brigade of light tanks together with the 22nd Infantry Regiment of Colonial Troops attacked in the direction of the grooves of Lyme and Bale. Third Cyrus Regiment of medium tanks with the 7th Motorized Dragoon Regiment attacked Bray. The main artillery fire was concentrated on supporting the centre. As night fell, the first line was taken. In the Juppie area, the remnants of the German battalion defending this point surrendered. In the Limio area, among other spoils, we captured several anti-tank batteries and found the remains of tanks of the British Mechanized Brigade, which had been destroyed by these batteries a few days earlier. It's at dawn, we moved forward again. The left flank was to seize the points of Moyenville and Bayonfey, the centre, to take Eushenville and Villers, the right flank, the point of Marais, and the highlights of the whole plan was the actions of Tanks B, whose task was to move from west to east to cut the German lines from the rear. The final goal for all was the height of Mont Cobra. The day was exceptionally hard. Having received reinforcements, the enemy began to offer even fiercer resistance. His heavy artillery on the right bank of the Summy shelled us furiously, and other batteries firing from the heights of Mont Cobra also inflicted heavy losses on us. But by evening the objective had been reached. Only the garrison of Mont Cobot still held firm. On both sides there were many killed. Our tanks were badly damaged. There were no more than a hundred of them left in formation. And despite all this, over the battlefield hovered the spirit of victory. Everyone held his head high. Even the wounded were smiling. It seemed that the guns were firing cheerfully. As a result of persistent fighting, the Germans could not withstand our onslaught and retreated. In the book Abbeville, dedicated to the description of the fighting German division Blummer, which defended the bridgehead on the Somme, Major Goering a few weeks after these events row. What happened on May 28? The enemy attacked us with large armoured forces. Our anti-tank units fought heroically. However, the effectiveness of their strikes was greatly reduced due to the strength of French armour. The enemy tanks managed to break through between Yuppie and Komen. After our anti-tank defences were destroyed, the infantry retreated. When the alarming news reached the division headquarters, the division commander himself went to the front line, as under the continuous fire of French artillery, he could not contact any of the battalions leading the battle. He met the disorderly retreating troops, regrouped them, put them in order and directed them to the defensive positions prepared in the rear, a few kilometres behind the front lines. Terror before the onslaught of tanks seized the soldiers. The losses are heavy. There is not a single soldier who has not lost a close comrade. Meanwhile, the Germans received reinforcements. On the night of May 27-28, they were already able to change all their units. This was evidenced by the picked-up corpses and the testimony of prisoners. In the night from May 28 to May 29, the enemy again changed troops. Thus, on the third day of the battle, as well as on the second, we had to face fresh forces. We did not receive any reinforcements, and in the meantime, to complete the success, lacked a little. Well, on May 29, with the same forces, we would attack again. This time, we were going to storm the Mont Cobra Heights. The main blow was to be directed to its western slopes. From Moyenville and Bienfais were to act the remaining of our tanks B, as well as tanks Samuer, 
transferred from the right flank to the left. They were to be followed by the Jager Battalion, which had not even half of its personnel left, the Reconnaissance Regiment, which had lost two-thirds of its personnel, and the Dragoon Division. From the area of Villers was supposed to move the remaining tanks Renault, along with the 22nd Infantry Regiment of the Colonial Troops. To give us support, General Altmaier ordered the 5th Light Cavalry Division, stretched along the Summy downstream from the Abbeville Bridgehead, to extend its right flank to Cambrone. However, this division was unable to advance. The general asked to send bomber aviation to strike at the exits from Abbeville, but the planes were busy in other areas. At 5 p.m., we went on the attack. We succeeded in occupying the slopes of the Montcober Heights, but its crest remained in enemy hands. In the evening, supported by powerful artillery, the Germans counterattacked Moyenville and Bayenfaise, but they failed to retake these points. On May 30, the 4th Armoured Division was replaced by the 4th Armoured Division, which had just arrived in France, absolutely fresh and youthful 51st Scottish Division, led by General Fortune. The 4th Armoured Division, concentrated near Beauvoir, together with me, regimental commanders, summarised the operation. Here were the commanders of tank regiment Saudre, Simonen and Francois, the commander of the Reconnaissance Regiment Arm, the commander of the Jager Regiment Bertrand, the commander of the Infantry Regiment of Colonial Troops Lee Tacon, the commander of the Dragoon Regiment de Longamar, the commanders of Artillery Regiments Chabdassil and Anselm and from the headquarters, Chomel. We were not able to completely eliminate the Abville bridgehead of the enemy, but we still three quarters of its size reduced. In this form, it was no longer suitable as a base for the offensive of large forces. For this, it would have to be previously expanded again. We suffered heavy losses, but still less than the enemy, and captured 500 prisoners, not counting those we'd had taken at Moncornet. A large quantity of arms and military equipment fell into our hands. Alas, will it be possible in this battle for France, I thought at the time, to capture anything more than this strip of land of 14 kilometres? How many Germans will be taken prisoners, if we do not count those belonging to the crews of airplanes shot down over our lines? What success is in the place of this wretched, weak, poorly manned, hastily assembled, and fighting a lone division could be achieved in these May days by a select armoured force, for the creation of which, in fact, many of the necessary elements already existed, although these elements were scattered and misused. If the government had fulfilled its purpose, if it had timely directed the military system of the country along the path of action instead of inaction, if, as a result, our military commanders had at their disposal a striking and manoeuvrable army, the question of the creation of which had been repeatedly put before the government and the command, then our armed forces could have counted on success and France would have regained her greatness. But on May 30 the battle was actually already lost. Two days before, the Belgian king and his army had capitulated, the British army began the evacuation of Dunkirk. The remnants of French troops in the Nord Department also tried to evacuate by... This retreat was fraught with heavy casualties. Soon the enemy began the second stage of the offensive in a southerly direction, having before him an enemy whose forces had already been reduced by one-third and who more than ever was deprived of the means to resist the German mechanised troops. I was in Picardy and did not fill myself with illusions, but I tried at the same time not to lose hope. If it is ultimately impossible to remedy the situation in the metropolis, then it must be done elsewhere. We have an empire. We have a navy that can defend it. We have a people who, though they will inevitably be the victims of invasion, yet true to their republican principles, will not give up resistance. A severe trial will engender in them a spirit of unity. Finally, there is the free world, which can supply us with new weapons and give us strong support. The question is, will the authorities in the most dire circumstances, be able to preserve the state, protect independence and defend the future, or, gripped by the panic of defeat, will they give everything to the enemy? In this respect, as I foresee it, much will depend on the attitude of the command. It may be the anchor of salvation for a dying nation if it holds high the banner until, in accordance with the dictates of the statute, all means dictated by duty and honour have been exhausted. In short, if it decides, in case of emergency, to continue the resistance in Africa. If, however, it should itself refuse to continue the struggle and thus push the weakened state apparatus to surrender, nothing could wash away the shame of having humiliated France. Such thoughts possessed me when, on June 1, at General Wagan's summons, I went to see him. 
The commander-in-chief received me at the Chateau of Montre. In his words, in his manner, there was his usual clearness and simplicity. First of all, he praised the Abbeville operation, for which he had commended me very flatteringly shortly before in an order to the troops. Then he asked my opinion on the use of those twelve hundred modern tanks that were still at our disposal. I replied to the commander-in-chief that, in my opinion, these tanks should be immediately combined into two groups. One group, the main, should be created north of Paris, and the second, south of Reims. The core of these groups should be tanks left from our armoured divisions. As the commander of the first group, I suggested the inspector of tank troops, General Delestrine. These groups should be attached respectively three and two infantry divisions, provided with vehicles and double the amount of artillery. Thus, we would have the opportunity to strike unexpected blows on the flanks of one or another of the German mechanized corps, which, moving forward after the breakthrough of our defensive lines, would find themselves dismembered along the front and stretched in depth. General Weygan took note of my suggestions. Afterward, he outlined to me the prospect of the course of the fighting. On the 6th of June, he said, I shall be attacked on the Salmon on the Aisne. Twice as many German divisions will be operating against me as we have, and that means that our position is almost hopeless. If events will not develop too turbulent, if I have time to return to the French units that broke out of Dunkirk, if I was able to arm them, if the newly equipped British troops back into the fight, if finally the British would agree to enter the battle on the continent of significant forces of their aviation, then we still have a chance for success. And, shaking his head, the commander-in-chief added, otherwise. Now everything became clear to me. In a depressed state I walked away from General Wagon. Suddenly a heavy burden had fallen on his shoulders, a burden he could not bear. When he assumed the post of commander-in-chief on May 20, it was undoubtedly no longer possible to win the battle for France. General Wagan seems to have been convinced of this fact unexpectedly to himself. As he had never foreseen the true possibilities of a mechanized army, the tremendous successes which the enemy had achieved so lightning fast by means of this force astonished him. To counter the misfortune, he had to be reborn. He had to break with outmoded notions, to change the very tempo of action. In his strategy, he had to go beyond the narrow confines of the metropolis, to turn against the enemy the very deadly weapons that the enemy had used, and to take advantage of such trump cards as vast spaces, vast resources and great speeds, distant territories, allied forces and sea expanses. But Wigan was not the man to do this. His age and mindset were not, and most importantly, he lacked the proper temperament. By nature, Weigand was a brilliant performer. In this role he served Foch admirably. In 1920, it was he who insisted that Pilsudski adopt the plan that saved Poland. As chief of the general staff, he consistently and courageously pressed the vital interests of the army on a number of ministers to whom he was subordinate. However, if the qualities necessary for staff service and the qualities necessary for commanding troops and do not contradict each other, then between them should not be equaled. Decisiveness in action, independence in decisions, fearlessness in the face of fate, that intense and special passion that is inherent in a true military leader. All this Weigand was deprived of, and for this he was not prepared. Whether as a result of personal inclination or circumstance, but throughout his military career he had never commanded anything. No regiment, no brigade, no division, no corps, no army had ever seen him as its commander. In choosing General Weihan, the government took the most desperate risk in our military history, and did so, not because it thought him fit for the role assigned to him, but on the pretext that Weihan was the banner. All this was the result of an error peculiar to our politics, which tends to take the easiest paths. At any rate, once it was recognized that General Weigand was not fit to be commander-in-chief, it should have been necessary for him to resign the post, either by resignation or by a decision of the government. Neither of these things happened. Seized by the flow of events, the commander-in-chief put up with them and began to look for a way out in the way available to him, the way of surrender but since he did not want to assume responsibility for it, his actions were reduced to inducing the government to surrender. He found support in the person of Marshal Petain, who for other reasons insisted on the same decision. Faithless and incapable of anything, the regime took the worst possible path. Thus, France had to pay not only for its military defeat, but also for the enslavement of the state. This confirms once again the truth that, only by defending the greatness of a country in the face of great adversity, can it be saved?
On June 5, I learned that the enemy was resuming the offensive. In the afternoon I went to General Freire, commander of the 7th Army, in whose zone my division was located, for instructions. While the staff was sorting out the alarming reports, this real soldier, behind whose outward coolness there was doubt and reticence, said to me, We are overcome by an illness. It is said that you will be appointed minister, but it is too late to hope for recovery. If only honour could be saved.